Welcome, friends and foes, survivors and killers. Let's sit around the campfire together and talk about Dead by Daylight. Specifically about the newest chapter, A Binding of Kin, that's currently on the PDB. Initially, I was reasonably interested in the twins. As much from a gameplay perspective as I was from a lore one, because I am a killer main and I find the lore of killers, as a rule, more interesting than the lore of survivors. So I was 100% geared up to make the next video after the hag law ran about the twins. To capitalise on that new chapter influx of views and milk that content cash cow for all it was worth. Well, it would be a cash cow if I was able to actually monetize this shit yet, which I can't do. However, when I actually got round to reading the new law for the chapter, I realised I was making a very big mistake. Because while Charlotte and Victor do come with their fair share of interesting curios and controversial talking points, no, Victor is not a baby, yes he is a child. The other piece of lore we've received from this chapter is a whole different beast. I don't wish to sound overly dramatic here, but to everyone out there who loves the lore of this game as much as I do, hold on to your hats, because nothing will ever be the same again. Yes, as the title of this video has given away by now, I'm talking about the new survivor, Elodie Rakoto. What is that Elodie? She hails from the present day, like most survivors do, and is an inhabitant of Paris born to a Madagascan family. This is where the unremarkable world parts of her character kind of end. So I was going to preface what I'm about to go over with a quick disclaimer. This lore video contains world building elements that allude to the stories of Felix Richter, the Blight and the Twins. So if you're not at all familiar with their lore, I'd recommend taking a quick look. As a matter of fact, the first video I ever did on this channel was a lore video about the Blight, so if you're at all curious, the link is right here. So what is it about Elodie's lore that has me so shaken up? Let's start off small here by looking into her character, which had been hinted at back in the first ever tome, at the same time that the Blight was. Interestingly, I haven't seen anywhere near as much of a response from the community recognising this detective figure as being Elodie as we did from people recognising the Blight as the Alchemist. Although a lot of that is probably down to the Elodie section, taking up all of a couple of sentences. Despite Elodie's lore largely being world building, as opposed to the more intense, up close and personal character study of someone like Felix or Yui, we still get a crystal clear sense of what kind of person Elodie is. Elodie Rakoto is, to put it bluntly, a young woman defined by her obsession. You become obsessed with the entity. She cannot get over the loss of her parents on Dyer Island, and the lack of closure that resulted from that loss going totally unexplained resulted in a crippling obsession to find the truth, to probe the shadows of commonly accepted knowledge and unravel the hidden secrets behind things we were never supposed to learn, never meant to notice. I hope you can start to see why I like her so much now. Start from the beginning. Tell me everything you know. And this isn't just presented as some tawdry quirk either, like Ace spending all of his story putting off a midlife crisis. Elodie's obsession is taken very seriously by the story, and I really like that. The fact that she's all but abandoned the idea of a rational explanation for her parents' disappearances is tied together with her grief and subsequent depression. Her search for truth isn't just wanderlust, but therapy to help her find closure and make peace with her past. This is where I'd like to start drawing comparisons with her immediate predecessor, the German architect Felix Richter. The two met each other in adolescence according to Elodie's law, and it's clear that the two of them are very different people. Felix is a much more reserved person, and as such bottled up his grief for his parents' disappearances, with his father's shadow hanging over him as he tries to live his life the way he would have wanted, to carry on his father's legacy. This is substantially different from Elodie's coping mechanism. While Felix tried to drown his lack of closure in work, Elodie has turned her lack of closure into her work, and will not rest until her work is done. That is the fundamental difference between the two of them. Felix values the legacy of his father, and the legacy he will leave his son in turn, over getting closure for himself. While Elodie values that closure and has tasked herself with putting an end to the mystery of Dyer Island for good, so she can finally get that closure. And what a mystery it is. Dyer Island, which is where Talbot Grimes, aka The Blight, worked during his stint in the employ of the British East India Company, is the site of Felix and Elodie's meeting as teenagers. 
and where their parents disappeared off the face of the planet. As it turns out, the Rakoto and Richter families were both members of the Imperiati, a secret society apparently dedicated to the expulsion of dark and ominous forces across the world. Elodie's law gives both the name and the genders of those forces. In fact, she encounters them herself in the course of her life as an investigator, a shadowy cult known as the Black Veil, that worships the entity and offers up human sacrifices to it. This cult was alluded to in the same Arcus passage that Elodie herself had mentioned in, but it's really fleshed out here. Two characteristics of this cult, the dark robes and the use of a crypt as a place of worship and sacrifice, bring to mind the image of this cult hiding behind the facade of a legitimate monastic order, which elegantly ties into the Blight's lore. After working for the East India Company, Talbot Grimes found himself in the custody of a group running a hidden school of forbidden lore, under the guise of a monastery. Given that the Blight's knowledge he gained from the school allowed him to eventually cross over into the realm of the entity, it's safe to assume now that the school was part of the Black Veil's operation, or a similar cult working to the same goals seeking to use Talbot's research to further their own nefarious ends. That would also explain why Dyer Island, the Blight's home during the First Opium War, would become the meeting place for the Imperiati. If their objective is to stamp out ominous forces, such as a cult worshipping the Entity, then it seemed logical that they should meet somewhere where one of its most prolific scholars used to live. But, I hear you ask, how does this tie into the Twins? We have the connections to Felix and the Blight already established, but what about the killer Elodie is releasing with? What do they have to do with any of this? As luck would have it, the caretakers of Charlotte and Victor Dessay after the execution of their mother were, in fact, members of that very same cult. Well, I say caretakers. Experimented on the pair and eventually killed Victor, so there wasn't really much care involved, but that isn't my point. The Black Veil, or a similar cult to the entity, but I'm just going to call them the Black Veil for simplicity's sake, were directly involved in the descent of Charlotte and Victor into the killers that we see today. They were responsible for Victor's apparent death at the sacrificial altar. The experimentation is presumably why his dead body returned to life. And it was them who escorted first him and then Charlotte into the fog when her anger at her sorry life had kindled into a seething flame of hatred. Interesting reaction. But what does it mean? Knowing this establishes a few things for us. Firstly, it suggests that the Black Veil is, to some degree, responsible for the selection of killers to go into the fog, and partake in the Entity's trials. While Felix shows no suggestion of being directly influenced by the Black Veil, and Elodie explicitly escapes them before arriving in the fog, Charlotte and Victor were groomed by the cult to become killers from a young age. There may also be behind the selection of certain survivors that we see, but we can't say that conclusively yet. More notably, it shows us that the Black Veil as an organisation predates the Blight story quite considerably. Talbot Grimes working in the school in the early 1840s during the closing days of the First Opium War. But Charlotte and Victor were taken by the Black Veil during the 17th century, approximately 200 years prior. And it seemed to have been well established as an organisation during that time, since they popped up all over France, chasing Charlotte throughout her adolescence. This begs the question. How old really is the Black Veil? Given that we know they've been influencing killers since at least 17th century across the world, this opens up some interesting possibilities. How many killers do we see today in Dead by Daylight who unwittingly owe their current existence as a killer in the Entity's service to the machinations of the Black Veil behind the scenes? I can only imagine for a global organisation as old as a concept of continental drift, it would be fairly simple to arrange for, say, a body to be dumped in the back of a car in a wrecker's yard, for example. Or perhaps see to it that a hard done by Japanese family man loses his job at the worst possible moment. It wouldn't have been difficult for some strings to be pulled somewhere to ensure a certain doctor finds his way onto a CIA black site program where his skills can flourish unsupervised. Or even for them to smuggle in a few infected plague rats into the pre-Christian city of Babylon. Just thought experiments, meaningless examples, I promise. You might think I'm crazy for even suggesting such level of planning and foresight from developers that saw a really nice setup at Coal Tower, 
and decided to put a breakable wall on it for no reason other than to be mildly annoying. But my faith in behaviour's foresight skills is not without reason, dear friends. And I cannot believe I'm saying this, but the thing giving me all this faith that behaviour actually is what they're doing is the hag's law. No, I am not pulling your leg. The law I made a 15 minute video about only the other week where I shat all over it like a gorilla on a high fibre diet. That law is what makes me interested in the future development of other killer stories. Because take a look at the symbols Elodie draws to invoke the power of the entity. And then look at this clip from the hag's archive tome animation from her story. Stroke of luck. Did you see it? Look at Pam's hand. It's the same symbol Elodie uses to channel the entity's power. Yeah, I thought smart when I noticed it. Literal mega mind over here. Clearly there's been some meddling somewhere along the line that's brought the entity into Lisa's life surreptitiously. And behaviour isn't being completely plain about whatever that might be, or who might be behind it. Elodie's law has left the door open for killers old and new to have more detailed, cohesive, and interconnected backstories, while pushing towards a greater unified narrative for the game as a whole, which frankly is all I've ever wanted from Deborah Dillett's world building. All it needs is for behaviour to have their focus and willpower to actually commit to it and to follow through. Speaking of killers new, Elodie might have left a few more doors open on the way to that one too. God, this woman's a gift that keeps on giving. If we were to take the circle with a line through it, as a symbol associated with the black veil and the entity's magic, you'll notice it resembles this, the Greek letter phi. This might be a super long reach, but this could suggest that the origins of the black veil lie somewhere in Greece. If that's the case, an ancient Greek killer would be interesting, as a way to explore the birth of the black veil worship in the entity and at the same time cover a historical time period where mythical creatures, legendary heroes, and things that go bump in the night were dime a dozen in the cultural and religious zeitgeist. Okay, perhaps I dug a little too deep on this one. So let's finish up our rampant masked guessing with something a little more concrete. In Elodie's expeditions, collecting curios and relics about the entity's doings across the world, she dredged up a Maori statue depicting its spidery fangs. Since statues aren't typically known for being all that, um, fresh, this indicates that the entity was probably active in New Zealand in Maori territory in the past, at least in some significant capacity. And since survivors are almost universally from the modern era, it would seem likely that any future characters teased in this story set in the past would be killers, not survivors. So, let's just sum up all the wider lore implications that Elodie's story illuminates for us and perhaps see what we should be keeping our eyes open for in future chapters and tomes. More stories about the activity of the Entity, the Black Veil cult worshipping it on Earth, and the actions of the Imperiality to stop it, the Black Veil being integral to the backstories of upcoming survivors and killers, the other pariahs alongside Felix and Elodie making appearances and dealing with their loss in their own ways, the enhancement or outright retconning of pre-existing lore to fit the Black Veil or the Imperiality into their storylines, greater interconnection between survivors and killer stories, maybe involving Elodie's mysterious collector in this. Specifically, future content relating to the Maori people, and potentially also ancient Greece. And all of this, plus a decent amount of high quality character work, on a survivor who has been largely ignored amidst the arrival of the twins and doesn't even have a tome yet. Thank you, Behaviour, for this precious gift. Now buff plague, you fucking cowards. Elodie has opened up a Pandora's box of juicy, juicy lore for 90% of the playmates to completely ignore because it has nothing to do with the gameplay. Until the next killer comes out, based on my predictions and everyone else, there's no way to see it coming. Of course. Overall, Elodie is exactly what Devadella has needed for a very long time in terms of its lore. A license, a blank slate to rewrite half the game's story towards a central plotline governed by established characters, groups and goals that exist outside of the trials, and allow for the exploration of the entity as something other than just another omnipotent god. I know I probably don't speak for everyone here, but I personally cannot wait to see what behaviour decides to do with these concepts next. By the way, I'm calling it now, Maori Killer in the future, nobody's going to see it coming. You heard it here first. Or at least one from New Zealand. Mark my words. Alright, 
All right, friends and foes, thank you so much for giving this a watch. Please do like and subscribe if you haven't done so yet. And if you enjoyed it, if you didn't, then obviously don't bother. Um, yeah, the hack video did super well, so thank you all for that. The next video is probably going to be a League of Legends video. Um, or it could be um, a future video on the twins if you guys want to see that. So do let me know in the comments if you want to see a twins video. If not, I'll be cracking on with some new stuff. Uh, everyone, hope you had a hope you have a pleasant greeting of the greetings of the season, and I'll talk to you next time. See ya.